read this evening from the Gospel of Mark and chapter 10. Mark's Gospel and chapter 10. Let's share the word of God. Then he arose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan, and multitudes gathered to him again, and as he was accustomed, he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of div- divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to him, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. In the house with his disciples, uh, in the house his disciples also asked him again about the same matter. So he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Now as he was going out on the road... One came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, Do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. He answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go your way, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come. Take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Jesus answered and said, Assuredly I say to you, There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the Gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses, brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last 
first. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us tonight. Turn again to uh, Mark's Gospel in chapter uh, chapter 10, from verse uh, 17. As he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud on your father and your mother. They answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This story of the uh, rich young ruler appears in three of the four Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And each uh, account tells us that this young man was, was rich. In fact, we're told uh, that he was very rich. And Matthew tells us that he was young. And Luke tells us that he was a a ruler of some kind, which probably means that he was a prominent figure, a a leading light in in the local synagogue. And one of the most striking sentences here in Mark's account of this meeting with Jesus is there in verse 21. It's uh, typical of Mark's uh, graphic eyewitness account. Verse 21 tells us, Jesus looked at him, and that uh, phrase is better translated, gazed at him. Jesus gazed at him and loved him. So Mark portrays this rich young ruler as a very attractive and even lovable person. Not because he was rich or young or influential, but for other reasons. Maybe because of his youthful enthusiasm, we read that he came running to Jesus and in the heat of the the Middle East people don't don't run if they can avoid it Uh, but he comes running to Jesus and he shows this very sincere respect for Jesus for he falls on his knees before him we're told and there was his concern about spiritual things that you can see in the fact that he asks what he must do to gain eternal life. Now fortunately there are still some people in the world today who resemble the rich young ruler. Both men and women, both young and old, both rich and poor. And what is notable about them is not that they are influential or that they are wealthy, but that they are asking serious questions about the purpose of life and the meaning of life, as this young man is. They may not ask the question what to do to inherit eternal life because that's just not language that people are familiar with nowadays. That sounds a bit too archaic and a bit too religious for most people today. Nevertheless, people are concerned, aren't they, about the quality of life and what it means to be a human being and how to be liberated from the sense of alienation that's widespread and how to find themselves and how to develop a sense of identity and freedom and all those kind of questions that there are on people's minds today. And it seems to me that wherever there is some knowledge of Jesus, there's also a measure of respect for him. Even if people have lost respect for the church, there's still a measure of respect for the Lord Jesus. And many have this sneaking suspicion that Jesus may just have the answer to their questions and so they come metaphorically speaking they come running and kneeling to Jesus and Jesus gazes upon them as he does this young rich ruler here and he loves them however alongside the enthusiasm and the sincerity of the rich young ruler we also find some serious misunderstandings don't we In fact, he makes three major mistakes which the Gospel writers draw our attention to here in in the passage. 
And maybe someone here tonight is making exactly the same kind of mistakes as this young man. The first is this. He was completely wrong about Jesus. He was wrong about Jesus. He was wrong in his estimation and evaluation of Jesus. So we need to look at the conversation that develops here uh, between this rich young man and, and Jesus. Look at verse 17 again. As he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. Well, what's going on in that conversation, we might ask? Well, firstly, I want to say, straightforwardly, that Jesus is not drawing a distinction here between himself and God. He's not affirming God's goodness and in doing that denying his own goodness. That's not what's happening here. What he's doing is challenging the shallowness of this young man's question, the way he was thinking about things. In calling Jesus good and in asking about goodness, had he chosen his words carefully? Had he thought through the implication of his questions? He himself was a good Jew, so he knew. He must have known that there is only one who is good, and that is God himself. So, why is it that he calls Jesus good and asks him about goodness. Was it his intention to credit Jesus with the absolute goodness of God? Is that what he intended? Well, of course he didn't. Of course not. He had asked his question without thinking, without thinking carefully and seriously about it. And many, many people make exactly the same mistake today, before this young man and since this young man and to our own day repeat the same mistake as this young man asking questions but not thinking seriously about the questions that they are asking many speak of the goodness today don't they of Jesus Christ but they do so in such a thoughtless way don't think through the implications of the statement they say well yes he was a good man and he was a good teacher and he was a great example to people as to how they should live. But that kind of use of the word goodness is hopelessly inadequate when it comes to explaining who Jesus is. And it just will not tally with Jesus' own understanding of himself. How did Jesus understand himself? What did he say about himself? Well, just think about some of his astonishing claims. Jesus claimed an astonishing intimacy with God, whom he called Father. There was an intimacy he shared with God that is known by nobody else but him. That's what he says. He says, no one knows the Son except the Father, and nobody knows the Father except the Son and he to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So Jesus claims that between himself and God the Father, there exists this unique, reciprocal, uh, intimate relationship. So much so that Jesus could claim that only he knew the Father. And then Jesus claims to be the fulfillment, doesn't he, of all the Old Testament scriptures. And in doing that, he was claiming to be much more than just another prophet in the long succession of prophets down through the centuries, through the ages. But he was the one in whom all the prophecy of the Old Testament comes to its fulfillment and to its zenith. That's an astonishing claim to make. If any of us made a claim like that, we would immediately assume that such a person is totally deluded. So here is someone who says he has this unique relationship with God the Father. Here is someone who says the hundreds, the hundreds of prophecies of Old Testament Scripture 
all find their focus and their fulfillment in him. It's an astonishing claim to make. And Jesus also possessed and claimed a unique authority, an astonishing authority. He claimed to hold authority over all human beings, the authority to teach them about God, the authority to claim their love and their allegiance solely to himself, the authority to forgive the sins of penitent people, the authority to be their judge when they were not penitent. Those are astonishing claims for a person to make. Have you ever thought about those things, those three words, intimacy, fulfillment, and authority? Intimacy with God, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament scriptures, and an authority over all human beings. Nobody else in the history of this world has ever made claims like that. Only Jesus Christ. These are the words that sum up his self-consciousness, his understanding, his self-understanding. So you see, it's just not good enough to patronise someone like Jesus and to talk about the fact that he is good in some kind of vague way, saying he's a good man and he's a good teacher and he's a good example. That just will not do and he will not accept that kind of ascription. That is not the kind of goodness that is the goodness that he actually possesses and he will not accept that kind of assessment of himself. The only way you see that we can use this word good of Jesus in the proper sense in connection with Jesus is when we use it to confess that Jesus is good with the absolute goodness of God. That he is God. Anything short of that fails to recognize, completely fails to recognize Jesus for who he really is. This young man was totally mistaken in his estimation of Jesus. That was the first mistake he made. He didn't understand at all and hadn't thought about who Jesus is. And then the second mistake he made was that he was totally wrong in his estimation of himself. He was wrong about himself. He was not only wrong about Jesus, he was wrong in the way he viewed himself. He asked what he had to do to inherit eternal life. So evidently he imagined that eternal life is a reward that can be earned and that he was well able, he was perfectly capable of earning that reward by his own effort, by his own good deeds. By his own effort he had amassed a fortune, he was a very wealthy young man. By his own effort, he had climbed the social ladder in Israel. He was now an influential man in the society in which he lived his life. And he imagined that in this whole matter of salvation and eternal life, he could do just the same thing. He could achieve that also by his own effort. He could earn it. Why not? It shouldn't be a problem for someone of his caliber. That's the way he was thinking. That was his opinion of himself. And did you notice in his reply then that the Lord Jesus recited a very interesting selection of the Ten Commandments? After which this young man makes this utterly astonishing claim that he had kept them all from his childhood. Now, of course, he'd actually done nothing of the kind. And he was gravely mistaken about himself, as mistaken about himself as he had been mistaken about Jesus. And at least three things here indicate his mistake. And he had either forgotten them, or he had never known them at all. It seems to me that he had never heard Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, or he had forgotten it. Had he done so, he might have remembered that Jesus when he was teaching his disciples on that occasion, said that their righteousness had to exceed the righteousness 
of scribes and Pharisees, the men who in Jewish society were regarded as the most righteous, the most circumspect, upright men in society. And Jesus said to everyone, unless your righteousness exceeds their righteousness, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And it must be a greater righteousness. It must be a deeper righteousness. It must be a righteousness of the heart. What he's saying then is that God is not interested in a righteousness of words. He's not interested in a righteousness of deeds. He looks beyond all those things to the heart and to the motivation in someone's life. And so in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that it's perfectly possible for us to be a murderer or an adulterer in the heart. Even if you've never been either of those things in your actions. This young ruler seemed to know nothing about this deeper righteousness that Jesus talked about. He claimed that he wasn't a murderer, that he wasn't an adulterer, that he wasn't a thief, when without a doubt each of those things were true of him and true of us in our hearts. Nor did he seem to notice that when Jesus recited the Ten Commandments, he omitted one, one very crucial commandment in this man's case, which was the Tenth Commandment that prohibits covetousness. Covetousness, you see, was the darling sin of this young man's life. And at first Jesus passes over that, and the young man never even noticed that Jesus left it out. It was the same prohibi prohibition of covetousness, remember, that years later brought Saul of Tarsus to conviction of sin. He said, I never knew what it was to sin until the commandment said, you shall not covet. And covetousness, of course, is not simply a matter of our words and deeds, is it? Covetousness is in the heart. It is a secret sin. It is a motivation. It is a hunger it is a pang, it is greed in the heart. And then the third thing that he either hadn't noticed or didn't know was that the commandment that Jesus quoted, the commandments all related to our duty to our fellow man. Look again at verse, uh, verse 19 there. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honour your father and your mother. But Jesus entirely omitted the first four commandments which have to do with your duty to God and my duty to God. That we shall have no other gods before him, that we shall love him with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Jesus didn't mention any of those things. Perhaps that's another reason why this young man thought that he had kept all the commandments. He was wrong about himself, completely wrong in his estimation of himself. So he had too low an estimation of Jesus, didn't think seriously about who he really is, and he had far too high an estimation of himself. He claimed to have kept all the commandments, but he had not kept any of them in his heart and he had certainly not loved God with all his being he had put money in the place of God so there was no possibility of this young man gaining eternal life by, by keeping the commandments that's what Jesus is showing him here he thought that he could but he was completely mistaken and you are mistaken about yourself if you think that by your own effort by your own seeking to keep the commandments to please God, you can e gain eternal life. You are completely deceiving yourself. Jesus makes it plain that that is not possible. And there are multitudes today who are making just that mistake. What is our opinion of ourselves? How do you think about yourself? We usually like to think, don't we, that we are really quite nice people, that we are 
law-abiding, and of course we keep the commandments. We're not murderers, and we're not adulterers. We're, we're not like that. We're not thieves. We're not false witnesses. And when the time comes to stand before God on the day of judgment, well, of course he's going to accept someone like me. How can we be so blind? How can we get it so wrong? How can we have so little insight into our true condition before God? How does that happen? You see, the truth is that you and I, we, we don't know our hearts. I'm speaking to myself as, as well as to you. The truth is that we've broken every one of the ten commandments that God gave. And we do so regularly. Maybe we haven't done them in actual direct action, but we certainly have in our hearts. And our problem is it is the heart that God is looking at. That's what he's chiefly concerned about. What is the desire of my heart and my motives and my ambitions? We don't love our neighbor with anything like the degree to which we love ourselves, do we? And we certainly don't love God with all our being, as the commandments teach us. What we actually do is reverse the order that God has imposed. Instead of loving him first and then loving our neighbor and loving ourselves, we put ourselves first. And we put our neighbor next when it suits us. And maybe, just maybe, God, but somewhere in the distant background, we totally reverse the order. That is the essence of sin. Sin is our disastrous self-centeredness. And were it not that God loves us in spite of our self-centeredness and that Christ died for us, bearing the penalty for our sin in his own holy and innocent person, were it not for the love of God and for the cross of Jesus Christ, we would be irretrievably lost. There would be no hope for any of us. Now, have you ever noticed in this story of the rich young ru ruler that it's immediately preceded by the story of mothers bringing their babies to Jesus? And at that time, Jesus had said that the only way by which we might receive eternal life, the only way by which we may enter into the kingdom of God, which is the same thing, uh, the, the only way to enter the kingdom is to humble ourselves, he says, and to become as little children. And unless we are willing to receive eternal life as an unearned gift, we shall never receive it, and we shall never enter into God's kingdom. The rich young ruler thought that he could earn for himself eternal life by his own effort, but Jesus had taught that it must be and can only ever be received as a free gift just as a little child receives a gift from a parent or an aunt or friends, just opening their hand and receiving the gift. And this contrast between the rich young ruler and little children, I think, is a very deliberate contrast. I think that's why these Gospels are structured as they are. He was wrong about Jesus, and he was wrong about himself. And thirdly, he was wrong about life. He was wrong about life. Verse 21. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And then we are told, but he was sad at this word. And went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He had come to Jesus, running enthusiastically to him. He goes away so slowly and sadly. Because when it came to the crunch, his possessions meant more to him than the eternal life that he had said he wanted to possess. The possessions meant more. Now, I think Jesus meant it quite literally when he said to this young man about his health, uh, his wealth, he meant it quite literally when he says, go and sell all you possess 
and give your money to the poor and come, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus meant that when he spoke to this young man. Money, you see, was his idol and it was necessary for him to choose. He had to choose. Was it going to be his money or was it going to be Jesus Christ? And I suspect that Jesus still calls a minority of his disciples to exactly the same renunciation, to a total voluntary poverty. Some are still called to that. And yet it's plain in the New Testament that that's not the calling that comes to all of the followers of Jesus, or even most of the followers of Jesus. He doesn't issue this call to the majority, but to some, and certainly to this man, because money was his idol, and it had to go. What Jesus and the New Testament condemns, you see, is not money, but the love of money. In other words, covetousness. The Bible doesn't condemn possessions in themselves, but our putting our trust in possessions, finding security in our material possessions, that's what the Bible condemns as sin. So it's, it's not property, but it's materialism that's the issue. A preoccupation with possessions, with material goods, that is the sinful thing. We make an idol of these things. So Jesus goes on to warn us in verse 23. How hard it is, he says, for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And again, Jesus meant that. And you can't water that statement down. It's a very powerful statement. Now, some people try to get around this and they point out that in the Aramaic... There's one letter difference between the word for a camel and the word for rope. And they say, well, Jesus is just using an illustration here of trying to thread rope through the eye of a needle. That it's not so ridiculous as saying a camel. Others point out that there was a gate in the wall of Jerusalem that some called the eye of a needle because it was a small gate and the difficulty of getting a camel through a gate that size. And they tried to do away with the force of the words that Jesus uses here. But the fact is that you cannot water it down like that. The disciples knew exactly what Jesus meant when he spoke like this, because they say to him immediately in verse 26, Well, who then can be saved? And Jesus' answer is, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. In other words, all things are possible with God, even the conversion of the wealthy. God is able to root out of our lives the love of money so that our values and our priorities change when we become followers of the Lord Jesus. The spell of materialism, you see, can bro be broken so that we begin to love Jesus more than we love property. We love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and strength more than our money and our possessions. So that we can say with the Apostle Paul, I count everything else loss in comparison with the overwhelming gain of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffer the loss of all things and count them all as rubbish that I might gain Christ. People, you see, whose lives formerly have been dominated by wealth can learn and begin, I should say, to develop a life of simplicity and generosity and contentment. These things are impossible with men, but with God all things are possible, even the conversion of people whose lives formerly have dominated by wealth. So let me conclude then with these statements now tonight. This story challenges glib superficial, uh, superficial religiosity. It condemns that. It's possible, you see, to have great respect for Jesus, but to completely misunderstand him, to misunderstand his teaching, 
to have just a shallow, glib appreciation of Jesus and not really think about who he is. So we have a checklist. Do we understand Jesus? Are you clear that Jesus is not just a good man? He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a good example. But he is good with the goodness of God. Do you understand that? Have you appreciated that? Do you understand yourself? And have you thought about yourself in the right way? We are not the paragons of virtue that we sometimes like to imagine that we are. And might even portray ourselves to be. We've not kept the, gods, uh, the commandments of God. We can't possibly find salvation through keeping the commandments of God, through obeying those Ten Commandments, because they're utterly beyond our ability. There's only one hope. We must, as Jesus says, become like little children and receive his salvation as a free gift, unearned, undeserved, but freely given in the Gospel. Do you see that? Do you see that, or do you still cherish the illusion of your own goodness? Nothing, you see, nothing more effectively keeps people out of the kingdom of God than this delusion that we are good enough for God and that we can earn salvation. Left to ourselves, the only thing we'll earn for ourselves is hell. The only thing we'll earn is eternal condemnation. Left to ourselves, his eternal life is a free gift. And do you understand the meaning of life? Do you remember how Jesus said on one occasion that a man's life consists in the abundance of the things he possesses? No, he didn't say that, did he? That's what everybody around us tells us today. That a man's life consists in the abundance of the things he possesses. Jesus says a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. We can so easily fool ourselves about that. But you find any rich man who loves his wife or who loves his children and then he finds them on the operating table and ask him if he would give up everything that he has for them or for his own life. And he knows at that point that his life doesn't consist in the abundance of the things he possesses but that he can have all those things and lose his soul. True life is knowing God, Jesus says. This is life eternal, knowing God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And no earthly possession in life is worthy to be compared with that. Knowing God through Jesus Christ. So I'm saying to you tonight, don't make the mistake that this rich young ruler made. But come to Jesus Christ as he calls us here and follow him. And find in him the true satisfaction that all our riches can never buy. The Lord bless his word to us. Let's pray. We thank you, our gracious God, for the simplicity of your gospel. And we pray that tonight, by your spirit and your word, you may impress upon us a true appreciation of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that we might see that he is indeed very God of very God, the one you've sent into the world, the one who will be the judge of the living and the dead in the last day, but the one who comes before that day of judgment and pays the price for their sins so that only over his dead body will they go into that eternal perdition. Grant us a true appreciation of your Son and a true estimation of ourselves that we might acknowledge ourselves to be sinners who fall short of the glory of God and therefore cannot earn salvation, that we might come and receive as little children this gift that Jesus Christ offers us in the gospel. Help us to find real life in him and not to settle for the illusion and the delusions that have spoiled and ruined so many lives. Help us to see the truth, we pray, by your spirit and word tonight, for Jesus' sake. Amen.